making recording in progress. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the OSERA Working Group for VA PALS, the VA Partnership to Increase Access to Lung Screening, sponsored by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation and the VA Office of Rural Health. Uh, we are excited week by week to be ramping up and, and getting more uh, into the flow of this project. Uh, we are, uh, for today's meeting, we have a, a, a nominal agenda, but, uh, you know, we've got places for new business and Q&A, so don't feel bound by, by this. Uh, as a reminder, the VA PALS mission is to increase access to safe and effective lung, uh, uh, lung screening programs that save lives. Wouldn't it be nice if it had a U instead of an O? Uh, and uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, Every week when new people show up, we do introductions, but I see that everybody on our list is somebody we already know. And so in theory, we all know each other. Um, our tentative agenda is uh, to, um, when this introduction finishes, to do our progress since last meeting, what we're doing next, the help we want from the community, questions and comments, new business, and then next planned meeting. Uh, does anyone have any changes they would like to make to the, adjust to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda stands approved as submitted. Let's move to our next agenda item. Agenda item two, progress since last meeting, task completed and demos. We begin uh, with uh, discussion and, and demonstration from Ken McLaughlin about the new features of the form SIGME background. And to do that, I need to, we need to have Ken be the one doing the screen. Uh, can I? Do that from here, or do you need to do that from where you're at? Unfortunately, within the last three minutes, I just broke it. Oh, well, that's perfect. Um, would you prefer that we change the order to give you a chance to unbreak it, or do you want to just? Yes, okay, then let's change our order. Uh, this is a, the, the fun of having an actively developed project. Um, so. Uh, instead, let's uh, let's jump ahead a little bit to, um, I can show you uh, a copy of the form that I loaded before he broke it. And um, I can also talk about the, uh, error, the error handling strategies and the debugging flags and so forth that we have in, we have in mind for that. And then we can come around to the, the new features that are on the, on the form itself. So I'm going to flip over here and I don't want that. I want this, because here I have this, which is the current draft of the um, the SAMI background form, which is which is um, one of the two first forms that gets filled out when a when a potential participant in the program is is coming to find out whether whether they're um, eligible and whether we should go ahead and do the CT screening. So um, the things that I want to call out uh, first of all. Um, I suspect if I put the at debug in here, it will call over to Ken's version and break. So I'm going to leave that out. Let's start by talking about the mapping um, because we haven't popped the hood on this before. I don't think on these calls and it's one of the things I've wanted to talk about for a while. So the way that we're, you know, it, it, it has always been a natural to do web interfaces for months. Uh, all, even as early as 1992, we had people pointing out that the World Wide Web was going to be someday the new generation of user interfaces for Vista. It was just a natural fit because it allows you to do graphics or video or anything you want to, and yet to control it through a strictly graphical, a strictly textual basis. And Mumps is good at text, um, so uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, but uh, but it's but we're really uh, working on the tools for this project, um, taking tools that people have done before and trying to refine them uh, to to make them. You, to basically treat this project as a as a guinea pig to be the first one to to, to really try to fully use these tools in, in the way that we that we intend them to go in the future, and that means some of the the, the basic guidelines for um, how do you provide help and and how do you provide feedback when there are mistakes and and so forth. Uh, we're we're trying to develop a richer environment than people normally get with online forms uh, that corresponds to the kind of richness that they've come to expect uh, in the roll and scroll environment as far as, you know, the quality of the help and, and, and dialogue and so forth. Uh, and we'll get into some of what we're doing, but, but it turns out that one of the, from an architectural standpoint, one of the, one of the major uh, dimensions of this is that 
since we are taking an existing system developed by Mount Sinai that's basically a front end to a database, and we're mapping that on FileMan and saying for every field that's in the Mount Sinai database, we need to have an equivalent field or something like it in the FileMan database. And then we want to map that onto a web form that corresponds to that file. We're talking about a three-way mapping, right? I mean, we're, we're mapping two databases and we're mapping a form to those two databases. So there's a fundamentally, there is a mapping data marshaling problem that, that's, uh, that's, that's central to the architecture of what we're doing here. Um, and we are gradually developing the tools that will support that. Uh, they're in use now. And we want to kind of show you some of what's what, uh, some of how that works. So let me just do the following. Um, we, when you when you look at the background form, you, you see a number of fields. They, they have certain names on them. Um, but those of you familiar with the syntax of names in a FileMan database uh, might recognize that some of these are probably not the same names that they have in the FileMan database. In, indeed, if we go to the FileMan database, if I, I go here to the mump side, and uh, let's let's go take a look at it real quick. Data dictionary, list file attributes, and let's look at uh, SAMI background, like so. And we'll do a standard listing to start with. And uh, what, let me I scroll up to the top of this. 16, 15, 14, 10, almost there. Oh my goodness, I got there. Okay, a little too far. So what we have is a, is a standard FileMan list file attributes for the data dictionary. And um, obviously we're using FileMan 22 features because uh, I wouldn't let a project go by without creating keys and new style indexes, uh, obsessive that way. And I've taught everybody else to do the same thing. Uh, but you know, study ID right here has got to be uh, mapped onto study ID up here in the corner, like so. And if we roll down to the next field, here, day of birth. Let's see, do we have? I think that, yeah, day of birth is right here. Uh, there's an age field being stored, although in theory it could be calculated. But we're currently mapping it as closely as we can to the way Mount Sinai did it. Um, notice we have a patient name field preparing for the future, but there's no equivalent field here on the form. So, so this is the idea: is that is that we've got certain labels you know, occur a certain way on the form. And then we've got um, labels and titles in the data dictionary along with uh, data dictionary numbers and field numbers. And somehow we have to, we have to map these. If, if, if we don't want the whole process of building all these forms and, 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 and importing and exporting data to all have to be manually created. I mean, I know that has kept legions of medical informatics programmers uh, happily employed for decades, but really, we would like to get to the point where we automate the development of interfaces as much as possible so people can work on the really interesting problems, uh, like, you know, automating the software that helps to, you know, solve lung cancer. So um, along those lines, therefore, what we have developed, and it's, it's still at a, at, a, at a really crude stage, um, is we've got a spreadsheet format for representing the Mount Sinai fields, right? And then we've got a spreadsheet format for representing um, the fields that we created in FileMan. You know, this is the background form Kathy made this data dictionary. And um, I wrote a tool to export the data dictionary in CSV format and import it into the spreadsheet here. And then armed with both of those, we can then build this and right now it's a manual process, we can build this mapping in which the same spreadsheet lines up rows to say, this field that is called study ID with this capitalization and so forth, you know, in the original Mount Sinai database is called study ID all caps with the field number 0.01 with the location, you know, the first piece of the zero node and here's the type information and so forth. So what we're doing is mapping across from the Mount Sinai data structures to the file Vista data structures. And then this thing gets exported as a CSV file so that it's computable once it's been built. Even though this part is manual, once this has been built, other parts can be automated. And among the parts that can be automated is if I create the CSV file and export it, then George Lilly has written a tool. And I'm going to scroll back up to the punchline here. Is it here? No, it's here. Almost there. Almost there. Here we go. So they, uh, George Lilly has built a FileMan file called SAMI for mapping, which allows him to import the CSV data 
uh, to capture the mapping between the Mount Sinai data and the um, and the Fileman database data. So if we look at this code field SBSID, which means study ID of the background form, and it's lined up with field study ID, which is the point of one three eleven point one zero two, you can see that that's been captured here on this row, which represents the mapping between the Mount Sinai database and the Vista database. And every field now has some mapping like this. Part of the reason that this is manual is that the Mount Sinai database is a typical relational database and it can't handle subfiles. So there are a lot of flattened out uh, equivalents of subfiles that we then map to a subfile or things where things were broken out differently than we would like to do it. And we combine multiple fields into one field, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's still some manual component to it, but it, it results in the creation of this structure. This structure can then be used to map the FileMan data dictionary to the form because the form behind every one of these fields, unbeknownst to us, if we uh, pop up the, um, if we show the HTML, and I show page source, here we go. Wakey, wakey, here we go. Uh, then in here, we should find a reference to SBSID. Here's visit date, it's before that. Oh, here's date of birth, right? This is, this is the date of birth field. And um, in this, I'm looking for this right here, SBDOB. Uh, let's see, can I line this up? There. You see that row lit up in blue? And you see how it has this code SBDOB hidden inside of it. So up here on the form, when the user sees date of birth, the programmer and or the code have access to this internal code that says date of birth is actually also called SBDOB, which in our mapping file we captured here as SBDOB, originally having this field name mapped to this data dictionary. And then likewise, if we go into the Vista database, here's SBDOB and so forth. So you see what's going on is we're putting in place the connect the dot structures that allow us to link together the contents of the, of the, of the HTML form with the file mandated dictionaries and with the original Mount Sinai database. And we're trying to build the pieces. We've got maybe half of the pieces are built so far. Uh, to get us to the point where uh, we can automate the import and export of the data, but also eventually to automate the generation of the form. During this project, right now, we're, you know, the background form was built manually because we need an example to work off of. But once this is in place, we're going to be at the point where uh, we can then build the abstraction layer that will allow us to just run some code off of mapping files and configuration files and auto-generate uh, an HTML form that has the look and feel that we want um, and all the internal structures that are needed. So, so there's that. Ken, what's your current status? Come off a of mute there. He says, I'm ready to show. You're ready to show? Yep. Okay, well then let's switch over to you so you can walk them through the stuff that's new about this form this week. So what you need to do, Ken, is um, in Meeting Center, the um, WebEx app, you need to go up to Share in the menu up there. And then you can share either a particular applica application or you can share your screen. At least I hope so. Sharing. I don't think so. Do you have a way to stop sharing? Okay. Oh, it worked. Yay. Yay. Okay. We're learning. We're learning WebEx. Check us out. <laughs> We've done it before, but it's been a long time. So the idea here, we're trying to follow a few design ideas, largely from Edward Tufta, which involves reducing clutter so that <coughs> We've taken the opportunity to dim out a lot of these sections that don't apply until you click a box like this. Can you see that? Oh, yes. Um, there are other people who suggest actually hiding the sections entirely, but people sort of expect a certain amount of spatial consistency when they look at a form. They don't expect sections to just disappear. So we're keeping them in for the time being. 
The other thing that this mocks up is an error box at the top. This is following a guideline by um, the VA 508 um, recommendations. But we're, we're trying to improve on it somewhat. Um, for starters, we're numbering the errors instead of just showing flags. And if you click on the errors, it takes you to that specific error. So that just because the error message and the place where the error occurred is separated by a distance, it doesn't really matter. You can get to it pretty quickly. Uh, the final thing we're working on is just filling out the rest of this form, uh, making sure it all works. Um, for example, the secondhand tobacco smoke stuff. It's not all working yet, but we're almost there. And things basically continue. <laughs> we're about done with this. Uh, there's a little more infrastructure to get done with this, and then the rest of the form should go much more quickly. And that's pretty much it. Thanks, Ken. OK, let's switch back to me then. So you'll need to go up to share in meeting center. <coughs> OK, and then um, George is at a conference right now, but he wanted me to show a couple of things and, and talk about a couple of things. So one of the things we're going to talk about before I do the showing, um, I want to talk about the error processing. So right now, this entire thing is transaction oriented. Uh, nothing is error checked until you click test submission, or eventually that'll be replaced with, you know, submit form. Um, and at that point, um, it calls to the back end. And um, um, well, let's see, where are we right now? Where we are right now is there is a certain amount of hard coded testing that's being done based upon the data types as stored in the data dictionary. But what we want to do is replace that with code that's going to call either the database server validator, which is uh, uh, validate of, of up arrow DIE, or just directly go to the filer or updater, uh, which is file of up arrow DIE or update of DIE, uh, because they have built into them uh, you know, a, a very rich suite of capabilities when it comes to using the FileMan data dictionary uh, to enforce the, the proper answers. And whatever messages that, that they give back, whatever complaints they have, would show up at the top like this in this in this transactional format. That's what that's that's one of two tracks that we're currently pursuing for for how to um, how to do error processing on this form. And it's the simplest, obviously, because it, it's also the least useful to the users um, because they could get all the way through the form having having had some bad assumptions that we would rather have told them about at the beginning. But nevertheless, they give us all their answers. We submitted all the file man. File man tells us what's wrong. We build this hyperlinked um, error display at the top, which allows them to navigate around, fix all the problems, and then submit it again. But what we really want to get to uh, is where, as you're moving through the fields, anything that any error that can be detected at a field level uh, should be detected at a field level. Granted, there are some kinds of errors that um, require you to see multiple fields filled in at the same time. The fields might not be near each other, and so you wouldn't be able to tell, really, that that becomes more of a transaction level thing. There, there might always be a need for transaction level errors, and certainly it makes sense to always, as a safety net, do transaction level testing. And, and so this structure that we're designing here isn't going to go away. But what we hope to do is get to the point where if we enter a bad date, that the moment we try to leave the field, it tells us about it. And we thought about various ways to do this. One of the things that we want to avoid in the architecture of this is we don't want to do double entry of, of the algorithms. We don't want to have the algorithm stored once in file mandated dictionaries and then stored a second time written by hand in JavaScript because that creates a very brittle long-term growth pattern. Every time you change the data dictionaries, you break your forms. We don't want that. What we want is we want, form, we want data dictionary driven forms. And so after some discussion, although we talked about <laughs> 
you know, Mumps likes to write code. So we said, well, how about if Mumps writes the JavaScript that we insert? And it's like, well, we could do that. It, it, it's possible. It, it's out there. But there's, a, there's actually a, a, another approach, which, which is what Alexis is going to be working on, which is um, if we could embed the AJAX activity into the form so that at the time you fill out the visit date and begin to leave, if it does a quick AJAX call back to the server and calls FileMan to say, do you like, would you, would you like this answer for visit date? And then it comes back with the error message. We can deal with it right then at that moment on the fly. So this is still an HTML first approach where this isn't an EWD approach, but it's using some of the qualities that EWD has, um, inserting them as little, as little Ajax snippets uh, into the form. So uh, Alexis is going to be working on that with, um, along with uh, along with George and, and with Dom helping with the testing at the same time that that George and is going to continue developing um, this 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 basic uh, transactional approach to error processing again with with Dom helping us to tune it up uh, so we'll talk some more about that but that's that's basically what we're talking about is is the two paths that we want to pursue and we think that they both have to be present to have a to have a truly rich useful environment for the users and we think that's got to be there there is another topic we didn't talk about on yesterday's call, but I'll, I'll allude to it now, which is um, help text. Uh, we would like the capacity for help text on this form to be just as rich as it is on the Vista side. And on the Vista side, you could do one question mark help to get basic syntax, uh, which comes out of the, the help field, plus some additional stuff that FileMan generates for sets of codes, for dates, for pointers, and so on. And then two question mark help. Uh, to give you more extensive help, which either comes out of the description attribute of a field, or again, in the case of pointers, especially, uh, can involve some some additional code that's being run by 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 FileMan. So the question is how to get that richness uh, into these web forms, and um, we haven't decided, although we've committed to the idea that we are going to try to have that level of richness. We too much too much of the of, of the online web world is 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 really scanty and not all that friendly to users, and we want to we want to emulate these qualities that uh, that the roll and scroll has as far as really being willing to have virtually a conversation with the user to help guide them through the process, to help them understand where they are and, and what's going on. So, so that's where we are when it comes to uh, the error processing and, and what we're working on right now. In addition to that, George wanted me to show you this. Uh, if I take the same URL and I say and debug equals one, uh -huh. what happens is, this is, this is debugging mode. And what happens is it pops up onto the screen behind every text box uh, so some of the core information that, that I showed you that's stored um, inside the HTML but not normally shown to the user. So he knows, every one of these fields knows what its little field code is from the mapping, which allows you to get back to, to ARDIT's, you know, the Mount Sinai uh, field names. It knows uh, what the field number is in our, our Vista database. Uh, and of course, it's got uh, 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 um, the title of the field, if it has one, is, is also displayed. Notice also here, NJ6, comma 2, that's the, that's the data dictionary uh, field type information right out of the DD from the definition. And so that gives us the ability, if we forget as developers, we can we can remind ourselves, oh yeah, this is how this field is supposed to behave. It's, it's, it's what it should do. And then we can test the behavior and say, well, do we allow up to six, you know, before the decimal and two afterwards? Uh, it, you know, is it behaving numerically and so forth? So, uh, so this is a good feature and we think that we're gonna keep this here. We may eventually add um, some kind of switch that allows us to suppress it. Um, but if the switch is turned on, we want people to be able to say and debug equals one because debugging these things and connecting one of, one of the hardest problems with having multi-system, uh, uh, um, how, how do I express this? Multi-system processing where um, the user interface is running on one system, i.e. my laptop or, or your workstation, and the, and, the, and the processing is on another, is that on the boundary between the two, that's where everybody eventually ends up sweeping all the mistakes, saying, well, it can't be on my side, it must be over there. So we really need this connect the dot stuff to help us, to help people on both sides reach across and talk to each other using a common language. Uh, now there's also a debug equals two, some more verbose form of this. Uh, and what, what what's happened here is 
not just the text boxes, but also the drop down boxes and the radio buttons now also have the information. So it's more disruptive to the look and feel of the form uh, because it's inserted, you know, all this stuff here and, you know, all over, look here, look at the richness of information that has been crammed in here on the family history of lung cancer. If we go back to debug equals one, just for comparison, uh, you can see, you know, this was, this was pretty much unmolested um, in debug equals one mode. So, so this is what's present. And then um, the other thing I wanted to show you, one last thing, see how this says October 1st, 2017. And of course we know that it's SBDOP. I wanted to talk a little bit about the architecture um, of, of kind of how we put this together. So we're using a graph store inside the Vista system. Um, and the graph store uh, is, is using a kind of typical modern graph store technology, but written in MUPS uh, to, to act as a loading dock between um, the FileMan database and the form. We need a place where we can put the data before we commit to putting it into the database. And ideally, the same is true going the other direction. If we have some data that we want to take out of the database and use to produce a, a report in HTML, there needs to be a stage where we're, where we're staging it and marshalling it into the right, into HTML, where we need access to the data, but you know, it's not ready to go yet. So this idea of a middle space is, is one of the things that's missing from, from most database technologies. Most database technologies, either the data is in the database or it's not in the database, but it can't be both at the same time. But in real life, we're all constantly doing stuff in temp or X temp or elsewhere because we need a middle space that is neither in the database nor not in the database so that we can do our comparisons and make our evaluations and do our transformations and validation and so forth. So what we're doing for that here is, is rather than the usual thing, which is to do you know, an undocumented, non-standard, ad hoc approach in temp or extemp or a local array or somewhere else, we are starting something that we think is going to become an architectural pattern common to the future of, of, of all Vista files. And, and this is the idea of generating a loading dock uh, that, that, that sort of acts like a halo around the file. Uh, and I'm going to scroll back up to the start of it here. This, and the way that you can tell is you see the study ID is XXXX07. So likewise here, XXXX07, right there. This is the graph store um, and it's for SB form, which is just like all of the fields have little codes associated with them. Like uh, you'll recognize SBDOB, right? Which we were looking at earlier. The form itself also has a code associated with it. Now what we're talking about here with this is, is on the one hand, it's modest. Well, of course, why wouldn't you have a little alphanumeric code? But on the other hand, it's radical. Because going all the way back to the origins of FileMan, which predated string subscripts in MUMPS, the upright file where the data is stored has to be keyed by an artificial number that is invented uh, as a record number or a sub-record number. And it has no intrinsic meaning except for the rare cases when you can die from it and you, you, you just happen to have a number that's handy. But most of the time, it's just an arbitrary number. It's meaningless. It's a useless key which creates problems when you're doing data mapping between systems because you have to ignore the key and yet it's the key you've got. And most of the files in Vista still haven't been keyed with meaningful keys to help you connect the dots. So if we're doing something that involves, you know, nonstop all the time data interchange and data mapping between systems, we've got to get to where we're using more meaningful keys. And one of the ways that you can do that is that instead of assigning things an arbitrary artificial number that doesn't mean anything, you can assign them an, a condensed, abbreviated, and yet still meaningful code, alpha or alphanumeric code, that says something about what it is. Like this field is on the background form and it stores the age. This is on the background form and it stores the date of birth. So for a graph store, you get away from using the numbers and you start using these kind of meaningful uh, key codes. And, and when you do that, you get this, you get this sort of, you get this sort of a structure out of it. And so this thing can act like a loading dock. Um, the fields are not um, concatenated together. You don't have to use dollar piece. You don't have to look up in a table to find where the fields are. They're all right at the top, as it were. If you if you know your keys, like that you're working on this study ID and you're working on this form and you're interested in this field, then it takes you right to the data. It's a very, it's an even mumpsier approach 
uh, than file man compatibility. Um, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that's only possible now that disk drives are so big. Uh, so that we can afford to pay a little bit more space uh, to do the extra indexing in the in the in the multi multi subscript structure, but here it is, and and this is the mapping structure that exists uh, between the form on the one hand, right? These dates you should recognize that uh, the visit date is is October first, uh, right there, and and the date of birth is 1956, which is right there. So all the data is is at hand, and this is what George is using uh, when he's filing the data or validating the data. This is this is the in between zone. And so, so this is what he's working on, is, is the process of, on the one hand, uh, getting this stuff validated, and on the other, filing this into the final FileMan uh, database location, where it'll be in the background file. And of course, I don't think it's there yet. I think he's, but I, you know, in, the, in, 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 in nothing up my sleeve fashion, I'm gonna go ahead and look anyway, just to see. If we look at the SAMI background form, yeah, no entries, right? So, so it's not here yet, but it will be, right? It's coming. You can see that it has come all the way across into months, and now we're running validation on it. And as soon as we get to the point where we know that it's valid, he's just going to put it into an FDA structure and, and call update or file, and it'll be in the database. And that's how it's going to go. And you can see how reports, likewise, will work off of that. And when you think about all the tools that were developed for FileMan 21 for the database server, uh, that, that could apply uh, to moving data out into a FileMan file out of a FileMan file into these intermediate structures like the FDA. And then you think about the graph store, which is optimized for being able to move things off the system or onto the system. And then you look at the way that we've, this is why we spent this time popping the hood today so you could see that these same mapping pieces of information are now embedded right into the HTML in a modular fashion so that everything in here can be, can be connected to the other side. We are very close to complete automation. Uh, it's gonna happen on this project. We'll, we'll get to the point where we can do complete automation on this. So I think that is the section on progress since last meeting. <laughs> some, of the, some of this was a little older than that, but we didn't get a chance to really show you in detail, but now we, now we have. What we're doing next, uh, Ken is continuing to work on the forms, as you can tell by the fact that he said forms five times in a row. Uh, you see, see the, it's, it's forms, 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 completing the rest of the forms. That's what Ken's working on. Uh, Alexis is working on two things. Uh, one is he's working on the AJAX approach to incremental validation of the form fields using FileMan. And on the other, uh, he's working on how best to encrypt the access and verify codes in our development environment so that we can generate Docker images that don't tell everybody what our access and verify codes are. Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be nice. Uh, and once that's done, we can start pushing the Docker images of our development environment out for the community to load into their own systems so that they can have copies, right? This is an open source project. We're gonna do open source two different ways. And one of them is here, have a whole Docker image. And the other way, of course, is, is repositories, which we'll talk about in a moment. George, uh, as I al alluded to, is working on the validation and working on the filer and working on how best to report back the error messages. But he's also gonna be side by side with that, he's gonna be working with Alexis on the incremental validation with FileMan. Dom is testing the forms and the validation framework for us. Thank God. <laughs> There's a lot of things to test here. And you know, Dom brings uh, uh, some, some excellent perspectives on uh, kind of what's normal and what's healthy and what's good in the way people do web uh, outside of the Vista world. So bless you, Dom. Uh, Kathy is uh, working with Ken, Alexis, and Dom to tune up error text as it's developed on the one hand. But on the other, what I did here myself manually in mapping the Mount Sinai database to the FileMan database, which then also becomes the mapping that's used to map to the form, she's gonna do that for the rest of the of the files, which makes sense because she built all the rest of the files. She even built that one. So she already knows the mapping. She had to do the mapping when she was creating the FileMan stuff. So she's obviously the ideal person to do that. So expect by, in, in the weeks to come, uh, we're going to have to be developing a lot more of these things. And these are all, by the way, going into our Git repository as well. So once once we get our Git repository public, you'll have access to this as well. Uh, Linda is setting up JIRA, right? Because it's time for us to set up the public side of our agile management approach so that you can all follow along and also so that you can all give us feedback. Uh, on problems that you see. You know, if, if, if you're getting copies of Docker images and um, you're getting access to a public Git repository, which, which is coming soon, 
um, then uh, you know the very first thing that'll happen when you send up your Docker image and, and import your, your your data from the Git repository is it's going to blow up and fail, right? I mean, this is a this is a progress in progress project. It's a project in progress, right? Why would it work out of the box? Well, we hope it'll work out of the box, but of course we promise to break it frequently, and you need some way to talk to us about things that are broken uh, more frequently than just once a week. So these calls will be here. And you can always bring up stuff on the calls, but you don't have to wait for that because you'll have access to Jira, and and we'll be we'll be watching Jira like hawks. So she's going to set that up, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that means for your responsibilities as well. Um, I also wanted to mention that I've finally written the first blog post for our working group uh, uh, section in Onocera, and it's. Because it references uh, our sponsors and things like that, it has to go through their approval processes. So that's uh, what's going on there and why we're taking a little longer to get our blog posts up. Yeah, the Mount Sinai folk. Sorry, go ahead. Linda, doesn't Astero already have the Jira set up? It exists in abstracto, but it doesn't have stuff in it about VA PALS yet. Yeah, it's, it's our data, uh, you know, what we're doing in particular that I need to set up, not Jira itself. Okay, thank you. Clarifying. That's what she'll be working on. And what am I working on? I have not been presenting my work on these calls so far. And that's fine, because it's in a weird state. Um, but we're getting there. Um, I'm working on the Mumps Advanced Shell. And the Mumps Advanced Shell underlies VA PALs, just like kernel and FileMan and other parts of infrastructure that are Vista specific underlie VA PALs. Also, the new standard lib, the MUMP standard library, MDC related stuff that, that's growing into the MUMP's advanced shell also underlies VA PALs. Uh, we've, we're going to have a lot of discussions over the months ahead with the Standards and Conventions Committee. Uh, VA PALS, I'll say Jira. Yeah, it's the Standards and Conventions Committee and, and, and with the Database Administration Committee and so forth to, to introduce them to the idea of the MUMPS Advanced Shell and how it works and why we're using it. But our goal is to make as much of this project reusable as possible. And we want to make it reusable not just in the Vista world, but in the whole MUMPS world. So a lot of it is getting is getting pushed down to the to, to the deeper layer underneath FileMan and Kernel that doesn't yet exist, but that we've been planning to create for the last 10 years we've been working on. Uh, and that's and that's MASH. And specifically I'm working on a micrometer that measures microtime uh, so that you can you can um, instrument your code uh, to to give back performance data. Uh, either in vitro in your test environments or in vivo in a production environment if you throw a switch. Uh, so uh, to collect that data in, in a consistent way, to have consistent data structures that allow not just for here are the steps of my subroutine, but also what if it calls other subroutines and they have steps, how do we tell them apart? And also what if it calls a great big loop in which each pass through the loop is big enough that it's measurable enough that you want to instrument it? How would you instrument the passes in the loop and make them appear in the data structure so you can tell that they're a loop and that they're not a subroutine call? Oh my God, all the work that went into this. Um, so we've been, that's, that's yet coming to a close now. And we've also got an analyzer that then takes all of the data about how long all of these different steps took and crunches the numbers uh, so that you can run your subroutine 10,000 times, say, and uh, help to wash out, you know, average out the other activities on the background of the system by doing that. And then, of course, you want your mean and your me median and your mode and your standard deviation and your, your maximum and your minimum and your totals and your counts and all of that standard good statistical information. And so we've got an analyzer that will take an input array uh, that, is, that, is a, that is the timing, the micro times from a run, and will crunch it and, and push out a statistics array uh, and, uh, and so forth. So that's almost all done. That's what I've been working on for the last couple of weeks. Once that it, that's in place, Place, I can then go through and start instrumenting our baseline code to insert these micrometer calls into them all so that they're all um, performance metering ready. And as part of that, I'll be refactoring uh, the web tools. Uh, that, that was, this was what, where George wanted me to start, the, the web tools that he's using to generate these forms and process these forms. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be refactoring them, creating new versions of them. In addition to that, uh, the Mumps Advanced Shell includes a lot of other stuff uh, like string manipulation and numeric manipulation and how to call out to Linux in a standard way and so forth. Uh, and I've got to get the rest of that into Avicenna. Our, our new development environment for this project, Avicenna, still doesn't have all of the Mumps Advanced Shell's tools uh, that we had over on the Taskman 9 uh, server, um, but I'll be finishing that up. That's what I'm working on this week. 
So this brings us to you, the community members. And we want to start with the help that we want from you, and then we'll switch to questions and comments so you guys can ask us questions and, you know, tell us we suck and all that stuff. So, so the first thing is uh, none of this is stuff we want from you right now, except for one thing. Uh, and Sam's not on the call, uh, as far as I saw last. So um, let's see, is, is, has, Sam, has Sam joined us? Is Sam here? No, Sam's not here. Uh, so maybe that's a discussion for next week. Uh, but here's the things we want. Um, we want, you know, once we actually start getting installed in test environments and production environments in the VA, we'll have a VA SIUG related to VA PALS. We'll want representatives from each of those sites to be together as a group and talk to each other as a group about the future of the software and, and, and to manage it together. Like a, like a clinical committee manages, uh, you know, how CPRS is configured at a site. But we're not there yet. But we like the golden pair. I mean, we're obsessed with the golden pair. We love it. We need a golden pair. We need people to give us feedback. So I can't, we can't wait. I mean, if we wait to, to form a golden pair until after we've finished a version of the software and are dropping it into a hospital, it's too late. So we would like to get feedback from some people who are willing to behave like users, even if you know maybe they're not actual clinicians. Um, and we were thinking that the community could do that, and we could we could maybe use this working group as a proto Um, you know, working with Jira, working with these calls and with other things to have you guys, a special interest user group, pull together uh, to be the VA pals proto uh and, and, and help to, to, to kibitz on what you see and try things out and, and give us feedback on what works and what doesn't work and what you'd change and so forth. And even though most of the people in this group right now aren't users per se and never will be, they're not going to be nurse navigators for this project or so on, still it'll be useful to have actual human beings other than us trying things out and going, oh, did you notice you misspelled this and all seven of us turn and look at it as one and go, no, we never noticed. Uh, our bad. We'll fix that. Uh, so, so that's one thing that we would like from you soon, but we got to get Jira set up for you. Likewise, if we're going to be using Jira to report problems, that means uh, anybody who hasn't yet gone through the process with, with Ocera of making sure that their, ac their access to the Ocera website is up to date and that they have got themselves access to Jira, a Jira account uh, through Ocera, this would be a good time to do that to prep yourself to get ready so that you can uh, you can uh, use Jira once it's up. We're also going to be um, let's talk about Docker Hub. I say I said Docker Hub, but really that's Docker Hub. I was I guess typing too quickly. Docker Hub is where we go for Docker images, right? It's 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 our system. It's it's like GitHub, but instead of repositories, it's Docker images. And Docker images are one of the things that we'll be pushing out. Uh, as as part of what we're doing, <clears throat> and it doesn't do any any good to push things out to some place that there's nobody ready to pick it up. So if you have never set up a Docker Hub account, you might want to do that. Go to DockerHub. Is it org or com? Uh, Alexis is looking it up. Um, anyway, we'll want, you want to go there and get yourself an account. And one of the questions that we have for the Osera folks is. Uh, we know that this is a new approach, although it came out of Ocera, it's still a new approach. It's different from what Ocera has been doing for the last few years. Mostly Ocera has been repository oriented. But the question is, as far as we know, Ocera doesn't yet have an Ocera Docker Hub account. So we don't know if that's something that you will want to get into and create one of. And if so, we would all use that. If it's not, if, if you're not ready to go there yet, or, or maybe you will someday, but you haven't decided, or maybe you never will. In any of those cases, for this project, we could use the Vista Expertise Network Docker Hub account. Um, but it's really a, a decision you guys need to make at an Ocera level. So um, go have a conversation about um, whether there should be an Ocera Docker Hub account, and if, if you want to do it now, and uh, and then we can we can have a discussion about it next week. Um, and then we'll be able to tell people where to go to get their Docker Hub images once we finish encrypting our access and verify codes. So there's that. Speaking of which. Discussion maybe next week with Sam on this call, if he can make it, would be to talk about his approach to encrypting access and verify codes and um, how he thinks it went. 
did he like it? Does he like the approach? Does he wish that he'd done a different approach? Uh, we're going to basically follow his advice for, for how to proceed. And if he doesn't want to wait till next week, you know, we could have a call in the meantime where he could email us or what have you. But this is a keen area of interest for us right now because this is the last major step remaining before we can start sharing our Docker Hub images. As soon as we put in place the encryption system for the access and verify codes, we're going to be able to start sharing with the community our Docker Hub images of our development account. And we want to share. So um, we want to have that conversation. The last thing is, around the same time that we stand up the Docker Hub account, or we either, either, either Osera stands up theirs and we start putting them there, or we use our own. Around that same time, we're going to do our first pushes to the public repositories that Osera has set up for this project. And so people will be able to clone those two repositories and stay in sync with us. And that's going to be pretty exciting too. So uh, it's coming soon, maybe by next week. It all depends on how, how this week goes. We'll see. Did somebody have a question? Um, this is Dave Witten. I was just asking you, could you clarify what Avicenna is? Yes. Avicenna is the name of our system. We named it after, you know, Avicenna. Uh, Who's, who's, who's one of the great heroes of medicine. Uh, Avicenna is, is the development system where, we, where the team together puts together our different pieces of work on the VA PALS project and finds out if, if, if I stepped on Alexis or he stepped on Linda or she stepped on George. Or, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is basically it's the, it's the VA PALS team development system, Avicenna. It also yeah. looks like it has not only development but integration too. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, it serves both functions, and of course, lots of testing. So, yeah. So, but the point is, when we put out our Docker Hub images of Avicenna, you will be able to have a copy of it on your own system, on Docker Hub, using Docker. And uh, when we put out our public repositories, our repositories are what we use internally in the team to move our um, data and code and documentation and so on from our private development areas into Avicenna. So once we start making those public, once once we once we as as part of our regular cycle of work push do a push at least once a week maybe more often from our private repositories to the Osera public repositories for VA PALS and for Mash, then you guys will be able to pull out of there as well. So you'll then be seeing both the flow of change. Um, and whenever you want, getting a snapshot. Open source, baby. We want this project to be open source. And we're now, as you can see from this week's meeting, coming very close. So is, there, there. is there already a wiki that you use to communicate, or have you chosen not to use that pair? Right now, we're mostly using Skype relentlessly. <laughs> We're on Skype all the time, but that's all internal to the team. Uh, what we want to do is move some of that communication more public, and and the um, Osera uh, website for VA PALS that era area uh, includes the capacity for a wiki. We haven't done anything with it yet, um, and of course it includes an area for posts and sharing documents, which which we intend to use. We also have our an internal staff website that we use for a lot of our documents. But that's just for us. It might be a little easier to share some parts of it. Yeah, there might be a way to share some parts of it. <laughs> we'll explore that. Go, Ken and uh, Alexis are pulling their hair out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So speaking of which, uh, if that's so, what we're basically saying is we don't need anything specifically from you yet, but we're going to want things from you all very, very soon. And I just wanted this, this week's call to help prep you guys for the kinds of things we're thinking about. But what we do want is questions and comments. So questions, comments, concerns, whatever. Let's, uh, let's work our way through the list and, and see what you, guys, uh, what you guys are thinking about. Hey, Rick, this is Anthony at Osera. I, I actually have to jump, jump off. I got to call it two. But I did uh, pass your question about our Docker hub uh, onto the tech team. Uh, so we'll shoot you an email, uh, you and Linda, and let you guys know. Thank you, Anthony. Much appreciated. Yep. And Sam's out of the conference today, but he should be back next week. That sounds great. Hey, and, uh, and before you run, do you have any other questions, comments, or concerns for us, Anthony? 
Uh, no questions, actually. It was, it was a pleasure to watch all the progress that took place in the past week or two since last time I was on. Um, but looks like you guys are doing a lot, so I just wanted to, you know, peek in and, and see how everything was going. So I appreciate the update. Thanks. Look forward to talking to you again soon, then. Have a good all call. Right. Thanks. David, do you have questions, comments, or concerns? Um, I don't think so right now. Um, I certainly know that there's, um, when we're speaking about if there's not a public wiki, that it should not be the same thing as a private wiki. In my past experience, sometimes you need to say things between members of the private group that you don't really want to say to the rest of the world. So uh, I don't know if that means that that would add a workload to, to copy things from the private wiki to a public wiki, but I just there is there's a bit of a warning there, and I just thought I'd mention it. Yeah, that makes um, sense. In case you're curious, I was thinking about the budget for the um, uh, Hui project ten years right. ago. Right, right. That's a good example, right? Because inside the team, we all want to talk about the budget, and are we spending the money too slowly or too quickly, or you know, do we have opportunities to do things? And you know, outside the project, as long as it all comes out to balance at the end, it, it doesn't matter. But if we put it all out there, then everybody can worry about it and argue about it, and that's a distraction from what we want them to focus on, which is let's talk about the medicine and how we're implementing it. Absolutely. Good point, David. So I'm excited about this. This looks really good. Yay. Okay. Um, Joel, do you have questions, comments, or concerns? Other, other than as, soon as, I, as soon as I try to unmute myself here, uh, my question is, how big would these Docker images be? Alexis will take that. Hi, uh, this is Alexis. Um, the download is um, slightly over one gigabyte. The expanded image running on your actual instant, uh, you know, computer, the host computer, is uh, just over four gigabytes right now. It really shouldn't get much bigger than that. In my Opticon provides a huge amount of that four gigabytes. Has there been some consideration for paring that down for the uh, Docker images and perhaps have that as a separate Docker image people could include or not include? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed the first part of your question. In my experience, the clinical lexicon is a large portion of that four gigabytes. I was asking, is it possible to have a pared down version of the Lex globals so therefore you would not have as big of an image and then perhaps have a separate Docker image that would expand the clinical lexicon for those who have the need of it? I think probably not because um, although we're starting by implementing uh, the first version of the Vista VA Pals, which is version 18, as a as a sort of standalone application inside of Vista, just replicating the Mount Sinai stuff, but but in Mumps and in Vista, the very next thing we're going to do is start weaving it into the rest of Vista. And one of the top priorities for that is to move away from sort of handcrafted field values where possible which Mount Sinai understandably did because it's a research database and it's cutting edge and you know they're inventing the terminology that someday will be standard but we got to move in the direction of standardized terminology and a lot of this stuff is going to have to refer to things in the lexicon uh, the lexicon is going to be very near and dear to this project um, once we once we get our our first complete standalone version done okay just trying to make the uh, burden a little bit lighter yeah, no, it's a great observation. I mean, that that is where a lot of the the space is, but um we'll be we'll be leaning on that. I will I will add that um part of what we're building into these uh, Docker images is um a script that can be run to um to update an existing Docker container running on someone's say laptop to match the present state of our development environment. And um, and so I'm hoping that we will very, very shortly here, within days, reach a point where um, it should be a very rare occurrence that someone needs to download uh, 
an updated Docker image, and instead, so that so that that one gigabyte download um, should should be you know a one time or a very rare occurrence, and then running this update script to bring your Docker container um, up to match the state of our development environment involves about a 400 megabyte download when the update script is run. It still means it takes, you know, four gigabytes of space on the host machine. But um, I would love to figure out how you're doing that. That's been an issue in disk itself for a huge amount of time. So um, anyway, that might be worth the discussion of how that works. Sure. I would love, well, we would love to have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. Other questions, comments, or concerns, Joel? Yeah, I would be interested in that as well. Uh. Okay. Uh, we could put that on the agenda for next week. Okay. Next, we'll, we'll, we'll put that on the agenda for next week's call. Anything else, Joel? Nope. I'm just okay. sitting here watching the waves go by. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, as, as part of uh, the work that I'm going to be doing on the month's advanced shell, one of the things that I mentioned to Joel uh, a month or two ago, uh, but I'll, I'll mention for the benefit of everybody else on, on the call, is um, I'm going through and doing refactoring on pretty much all of our core code uh, to, to, to bring it up to a new um, MDC months coding pattern that, that we've been putting together that we think uh, kind of will maximize maintainability and instrument the code for performance metering and a lot of other things. And at some point, I'm going to want to turn to the M unit and do that to M unit as well. And and Joel knows that he knows I'm, I'm planning to do that. And we'll be will be so there's going to come a point in this call in these calls uh, in in the, the not too distant future. Maybe maybe it'll start a few weeks from now um, when one of the topics of discussion on these calls will be will be. Um, will be M unit and, and the work that I'm doing that I'll be coordinating with Joel. Uh, we, in addition, aside from the, just the refactoring, keeping the code, you know, doing exactly what it does now, but, but kind of working on the maintainability. The other thing that's coming is there are some new features I want to add to the Mumps Advanced Shell, and, and we'll talk about those when we get to that point too. But right now I'm still working on, oh, far more primitive things like like microseconds. Speaking of which, um, if the community is interested and wants a little piece of homework for the next week, then they can see if they can come back with answers for next week. If there's anybody who's real comfortable with cache, I would like to know if there is a quick, simple way in cache to get the current time with microsecond precision. I need that for this project to fly. I have it in GTM starting with 6.3, but I don't know if there's anything like that in cache. I think I can find it. Uh, I, I know that you know we're getting the time so that we can subtract out uh, the differences in the M unit. The code's already in there for cache as well as for GTM, and down to the uh, microsecond. So uh, you know that's in there already because it gets the current time and then later subtracts. Uh, you know, the difference, so you get the difference. So, yes, that code is in there. Uh, Sweet. I'll locate it for you. Sweet. Thank you, Joel. And then uh, before we run out of time, uh, Steve, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns about uh, about what we talked about today? No, it looks good. I like the Thanks. mapping files. It's a good way to do it. I like the debug features. So looking forward to getting some Docker images and playing around with it a bit. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well then, uh, with that, uh, I then say, do we have any new business for today's call? We're out of time, so I think the answer has to be no by definition. And our, our next planned meeting is this same time next week? Next, yeah, next week, and we'll be uh, doing WebEx again instead of the old GoToMeeting. Um, if you have any friends who haven't uh, subscribed to our um, working group, uh, Session in Ocera, uh, please make sure to do that because that's where we will be letting people know the changes. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Hey, Steve. I don't think I've met you. This is David Witten. What kind of things do you do? So I do um, um, engineering for Philips Healthcare hmm. for my okay. full time job. But I'm, I've been interested in, uh, you know, Vista and 
Have you worked with David Mission? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, I thought he was working for Phillips, so maybe he's not working for them anymore. But he was doing an awful lot of uh, stuff with that from one point. Yeah. Well, and I worked with, uh, I worked in my, in a past life, I worked with uh, uh, Rick Avila at, at GE when mm -hmm. I was there. Okay. Was almost, he's a good man, too. Yeah, so. All right, but just curious. Yep. I'm working at uh, one of the hospitals over here in North Carolina. All so. uh, right. Just from there. All right. Have a pleasant day. Yep. And welcome Bye to our now. call. Yeah, thanks. Oh, that's good. It's nice work. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you next week.